and welcome to module 2. In this module, we are going to focus on livestock production and management. Ensuring that livestock stay healthy and productive is important to all farmers and pastoralists. So, what are some key questions that we should seek to answer to ensure that our animals are healthy and productive? Just like in human beings, food is an important element of healthy living. So the first question one needs to ask is, what are the feeding needs of my animals? Healthy living is also determined by where the animals live. Therefore, another key question is what are the housing needs of my livestock? We also need to keep in mind that animals like human beings are prone to diseases which may compromise their health. So, how do I protect my animals from pests and from being infected? And finally, a key consideration in ensuring healthy animals is breeding. So what are the breeding needs of my animals? This module aims to provide you with answers to all these questions as shown in the chat on your screen. Animals like us need a healthy diet that not only offers the energy and nutrition that it needs to function, but also offers several health benefits as well. Animals need both water and solid food with the necessary nutrients. We will begin by looking at water. Just as in human beings, lack of water will kill an animal faster than lack of any other nutrient. We will now take a look at water needs for livestock with a specific focus on dairy cattle. Water should be available to dairy cattle at all times. If this is not possible, a rule is to supply one liter of water for every 10 kilograms of live weight of the cow plus one and a half liters of water per liter of milk produced. As concerns solid food, animals like human beings need to consume appropriate amount of all the necessary nutrients. A healthy diet needs to have a balance of carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins and minerals. Carbohydrates give energy to the animals and we'll begin by looking at the animal's energy needs. Energy is the fuel that keeps all the body functions working. If energy in the ration is not enough, the animal will lose body condition and become too thin. On the other hand, if there is excess energy in the ration, the animal becomes too fat. The sources of energy are roughages which are found in straw or pasture grasses. Next we take a look at minerals. Though required in small amounts, minerals are essential for the animals to remain healthy and for the body to function properly. Macro minerals are required in larger amounts while micro minerals are required in small amounts. Some examples of macronutrients include number one, calcium. It is the most important constituent of the skeleton and teeth. Agricultural lime, fish meal, milk, crushed shells, marble dust, some seaweed and green leafy forages, especially legumes are good. Deficiency symptoms include rickets. This is where bones become soft and deformed in young stock and osteoporosis in older animals whereby the bones have holes and become very weak. Number two, phosphorus. This is needed for bone and teeth formation, building of body tissues, that is growth of animals, as well as milk and egg production. Sources of phosphorus include bone meal. Also, many improved salt leaks contain phosphorus. 
Cereal grains are good sources of phosphorus, but hay and straws have very low phosphorus content. Deficiency symptoms include animals eating soil, chewing on non-feeding objects, slow or poor appetite, slow gain of body weight, low milk or egg production. Magnesium is needed for proper functioning of the nervous system, carbohydrate metabolism and enzyme systems. Legumes usually contain a higher magnesium level than grasses. Well-known legumes include peas, beans and lentils. Deficiency symptoms are hyperexcitability and frequent death in animal stock, increased blood flow, convulsions and frothing at the mouth. It is not common in Africa. Number four, sulfur. A deficiency of sulfur will express itself as protein deficiency, general unthriftiness and poor performance. Sulfur can be found in leafy dark green vegetables like kale and cabbage. Next we will take a look at vitamins. Vitamins are also a key component of animal nutrition. We will now take a look at vitamin needs for livestock. Pigs need a lot more vitamin supplements than ruminants. As for ruminants, vitamin D can be produced by the pigs themselves if they are given a chance to spend time in the direct sunlight. Vitamin A Add 2 to 3% of good quality Lucerne meal, carrots, or dried crushed amaranth leaves. Riboflavin This is found in Lucerne meal, green plants, fish meal, or milk products. Vitamin B12 This vitamin is essential for maturation and energy production. A soya meal for their protein or a small addition of fish meal will be beneficial. Signs of deficiency include weight loss, suppressed appetite, decreased feed efficiency, anemia, diarrhea, rough coat, scaly ears, and weepy eyes. The housing structure for the animals also has a big effect on the health of the animal. And different animals have different housing structures based on the following factors. 1. Feeding Feeding requirements determine the type of housing. Poor housing can lead to waste of feed. So, to prevent waste of feed, a trough should be designed to suit the particular behavior pattern each species exhibits while feeding, that is, pecking in hands, rooting with forward and upward thrust in pigs, wrapping their tongue around the feed, that is grass, and jacking their heads forward in cattle. Next, we look at drinking. Drinking does determine the type of housing as some animals like cattle prefer to be able to see while drinking. Therefore, more animals can drink at once from a long narrow trough than from a low round one. We look at breeding. Differences in the environment, sex and strain affect the behavior of livestock and this in turn determines the housing needs. For example, cattle live in herds, but when giving birth, the cow attempts to find a quiet sheltered place away from the disturbance. Animal housing design should mainly be concerned with the physical environment, in particular climatic and mechanical factors. Hi Francis. Hello. Now today you're going to show us how to make a cow shed. Exactly. Thank you. I'll be more than happy to do that, Judy. 
-hmm. a shade structure of about uh, 2.5 meters to 3 meters mm -hmm. per animal should give uh, the minimum desirable protection uh, okay. for the cattle. Ah, and uh, how do you go about this, Francis? Uh, the roof should be about, uh, you know, three meters high uh, to allow for the air movement. Mm -hmm. And the paved surface behind there should be twice the shaded area. So that is the paved area? That's the paved area. Okay, okay. You see, if the longitudinal axis is from north to south, mm -hmm. the paved area behind there should be twice the area of the, of the shade. Thank you very much, Francis. Okay, thank you so much, Ide. Other forms of housing include number one, yards. If space is severely limited and only four to five meters per cow is available, then concrete paving is highly desirable. And number two, deep bedded sheds. In a deep bedded shed system, straw, sawdust, shavings, or other bedding material is periodically placed in a resting area so that the mixture of the bedding and manure build up in a thick layer. 3. Loose housing with free stalls. A loose housing yard and shed with free stalls will satisfy this need. Less beddings will be required and less manure will have to be removed. Number 4. Bullpens. A bullpen should have a shaded resting area of 12 to 15 meters and a large exercise area of 20 to 30 meters. The walls of the pen must be very strong. Number 5. Calf pens. The front of the calf pen should be made so that the calf can be fed milk, concentrates and water easily from the bucket or a trough fixed to the outside of the pen. Animals like human beings do fall sick and are prone to diseases. So how do we ensure that we protect our animals from diseases so that they can stay healthy and productive? We will now talk about a number of things that you need to look at and abnormalities and signs that you should be aware of. This will help you in identifying and dealing with livestock diseases. Some of the things you can look at are 1. Appearance of the animals Its expressions, general condition, skin, coat, mucous membrane, eyes, lymph nodes and behavior 2. Natural functions Appetite and thirst, respiration, heartbeat, defecation, urination and milk 3. Discharges also look at the color and type of discharges. Is it different or abnormal? And finally, swellings. Usually an unusual swelling is a sign of a problem. Livestock diseases pose a major challenge to production. The causal organisms need to be identified if they have to be managed. The main categories of diseases are 1. Endemic These are common diseases that occur at a constant but relatively low rate in the population area. These include ticks and tick-borne diseases. 2. Zoonotic These diseases are caused by infectious agents that can be transmitted between or are shared by animals and humans. 3. Epidemic. These include classical swine fever, African swine fever, contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, foot and mouth disease, and rinderpests. Learning how to control organisms that cause diseases is important in ensuring livestock are healthy. The most important control strategy is to prevent the disease through vaccination. We will now take a look at two of the common organisms of diseases affecting livestock and how to control them.
Bovine tuberculosis, that is TB, is an infectious disease of cattle and one of the biggest challenges facing the farming sector today. It is caused by the bacteria Microbacterium bovis, that is M. bovis, which can also infect and cause TB in badgers, deer, goats, pigs, camelids, which include llamas and alpacas, dogs and cats, as well as many other mammals. Bovine TB is usually a very slow disease to develop. Infected animals may not show any outward signs of illness, but many eventually exhibit weight loss and a gradual decline in general health. TB lesions may be found in any organ or body cavity of diseased animals. What signs an animal shows may depend on what organs are most infected. If the lungs are affected, there may be a chronic intermittent cough and labored breathing. The lesions usually show up as tubercles, that is noodles or knobby swellings, which is how tuberculosis received its name. The site of initial infection usually does not heal and the disease slowly progresses by bacteria spreading through the blood and the limbs. Bovine TB is not a highly infectious disease. Spread usually requires frequent and extended exposure. The greatest risk of spread is through respiration, that is breathing. There are no effective vaccines to prevent infection or economical medications to treat livestock after they become infected. In general, cattle brought onto the farm should come from herds established as free from TB. This can be done by bringing in animals only from a recognized monitored TB-free herd or from animals that have only been in TB-free status areas. Individual TB testing of cattle can be done before they're introduced into the herd, but results are not as accurate as on a whole herd test. The sick animals should be separated from the healthy ones. Foot and mouth disease. FMD is a highly contagious viral infectious disease of cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs. Signs include 1. Severe lameness. 2. The animals develop a high fever. 3. Cattle stop eating due to pain. And 4. There is a serious drop in milk production. Prevention and control can be achieved by 1. Report occurrence immediately to a veterinary doctor or to the nearest livestock authority office. 2. Isolate the animals. 3. Above all and most importantly, vaccinate regularly so as to ensure the safety of your animals. Animals can be had to recover by 1. Shed them from the sun and give them plenty of water. 2. Give the animals soft feeds. 3. Molasses to give the animals energy. And 4. Give the animals antibiotics. With this method, 3 to 4 percent rams are put among a flock of ewes or a herd of cattle. On extensive farms, especially in sheep, this is the most common breeding method. The farmer must also make sure that there are enough fertile rams available to mate with the ewes. Several methods can be used to make sure that the ewes are served. In beef cattle, the numbers are usually smaller and sometimes the farmers will give more attention to the heifers and the old cows. Here are some methods to make sure that mass mating is a success. Make sure that the rams are fertile by testing them before they are put among the ewes. If you mate for a period of six weeks, make sure the rams get rest during the mating period. Use between 3 to 4 percent fertile rams among the ewes, that is 3 percent when all the rams have experience, and 4 percent when some of the rams in the group are young rams. How to rest the rams? 
The best way to rest your rams is to divide the rams into two groups. Make sure the condition of the rams is good. Give them enough exercise. Exercise and good nutrition is the most important aspect to keep your male animals healthy and fertile. Put in half the rams for two weeks. Then the other half for the next two weeks and rest the first half. Put all the rams among the ewes for the last two weeks. It is also a good thing to make sure that the breeding animals, that is the male and females, mingle every day. One water trough in the breeding camp will help in this respect. For group mating, hand mating and artificial insemination, the farm has better control over the mating process and therefore fewer rams can be used. An important point to remember is that the ram must be observed and rams with poor libido and dexterity must be replaced with more vigorous rams. Group mating This is where the farmer selects a few ewes and makes them with a certain ram. The selected ewes accompanied by a selected ram are run in a small paddock or a camp for about one month. Hand mating. Hand mating is a little more complicated. The farmer runs his 300 ewes in a camp. Every morning the sheep are gathered in a big kraal and the teaser ram are put in with them. Then when a teaser ram identifies an ewe in ostras by mounting her, the ewe is caught and taken out and put in with a fatal ram in a small kraal. All the ewes that must be mated with that particular ram are put in the kraal with him. When the ram has mated the ewe, she is marked, put and record and returned to the mated flock. After all the estrus ewes are identified, the flock is allowed to graze for the rest of the day until afternoon. In the early evening, the flock is gathered again and the same procedure is repeated as in the morning. Ewes that were mated in the morning are mated again as well as the new ewes that are in ostras. The new ones are also marked and put among the mated ewes to be mated again the next morning. Artificial insemination Artificial insemination is a technical method of breeding. Although this method is commonly used in dairy farming, in sheep farming it is rare. A few management methods can be followed. Number one, the eels are synchronized by inserting a progesterone sponge into the vaginas. Number two, the sponge is removed and the eels are then injected with PMS, that is pregnant mare serum, to induce estrus as the eels start ovulating at the same time. Artificial insemination then can be carried out in the morning and in the afternoon. Special equipment will be needed to inseminate an eel. The second method follows the hand mating method to select ostras eels. The eels that are in ostras are then artificially inseminated. The procedure is repeated in the afternoon. Breeding. Breeding is a reproduction of offspring that helps to ensure the future of livestock. And as farmers and pastoralists, we need to be cautious of how we select our animals for breeding based on a number of factors that we will discuss. Because of the continuously changing environment, farmers and pastoralists in Africa are encouraged to develop effective breeding programs. The following are strategies to choose in improving one's breeding program. One. Crossbreed the indigenous breed with temperate breeds. Two, progressively substitute the breed with another local breed. And three, crossbreeding indigenous breeds with temperate breeds using artificial insemination. In dairy cattle, it seems often obvious to apply crossbreeding with temperate breeds 
also in tropical farming systems. For beef production, there are a number of high potential indigenous breeds available for tropical environments. And with that, we have come to the end of our module on livestock production and management. Effective livestock management involves knowing your breed so as to ensure livestock production is sufficient. A farmer also needs to know the feeding needs and knowing the right balance and quantity of nutrients. And as the animals feed and mature, a farmer needs to be able to protect his livestock, reduce the negative effects of pests and diseases. And finally, different animals have different housing needs so as to manage the livestock in an efficient and effective manner. We hope that the lesson will help you to improve on your livestock production and management. Thank you for watching and we wish you much success in your farming practice.